Matthew 22, 1 to 14. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent out his slaves to summon those invited to the banquet, but they didn't want to come. Again, he sent out other slaves and said, tell those who are invited, look, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went away. One to his own farm, another to his business, and the other seized his slaves, treated them outrageously and killed them. The king was enraged. So he sent out his troops, destroyed those murderers and burned down their city. Then he told his slaves, the banquet's ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go to where the roads exit the city and invite everyone you find to the banquet. So those slaves went out on the roads and gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. The wedding banquet was filled with guests. But when the king came in to view the guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed for a wedding. So he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him up hand and foot, throw him out into the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's an outline inside your newsletter on the left, uh, household questions top right, and there'll be an opportunity, God willing, to ask questions at the end. Uh, I worked for a very, very, very brief time uh, in federal politics. Uh, If you had to ask me to describe my job, I was the smallest nut on the smallest cog. So pretty insignificant in the big scheme of things. Uh, I had to be in Canberra during sitting weeks, and they are immensely busy weeks, uh, long hours. Uh, You'd start at seven and you'd finish well after seven. Much reading, digesting, writing, and question time. Uh, Each day we would spend time getting material together for our boss, uh, preparing him for the 10 most likely questions he'd be asked during question time. Some he knew were coming and some he didn't. Uh, He would then go off to the house for question time and all of us would gather in the office around the five or six screens to make sure that we'd done our job and he was well prepared. Uh, Sometimes during that time, watching Question Time, one of the senior advisors would realise that we hadn't given him a paper or some information and you'd get a tap on the shoulder and you'd have to run down to the house, uh, enter the house and give him that document. Uh, Anyone was welcome in the house. That's the nature of Australian democracy. But if you wanted to stay in the house, you had to be suitably dressed. And if you're a man, that meant you had to have at least a jacket and tie on, which was hard for a bloke like me who didn't own either. So that meant that on the back of the office door, there was always a spare jacket and tie. Uh, The tie was already done up, so you didn't have to bother. And if you had to go down to the house, you had to be dressed appropriately to stay in, and you'd quickly grab that and whack them on as you ran, and then you're allowed in the house and allowed to stay there. Anyone can get into the House of Representatives. But to stay in, you've got to be dressed appropriately. It's like that with the kingdom of heaven. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your clarity. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for invitations to a meal with your son. Help us to hear them and be changed by them. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, This is the second day of Jesus being in Jerusalem. Uh, His entry revealed his magnificence. His entry showed that this day had been prepared for a long time. Jesus is the king that God promised. Jesus has come to establish God's kingdom. Jesus has come to bring outsiders, sinners like us, inside. And he's come to confront insiders with their hypocrisy, disobedience and half-heartedness. Jesus has come to bind up the broken and to heal the sin damaged. And as he comes into Jerusalem, he causes a kerfuffle. It's the last week of his life. At the end of this week, he'll be rejected, he'll be crucified, and he'll rise from the dead. 
It's not a calm and peaceful week. Uh, To be blunt, I have found this week quite exhausting, this week in Jesus' life. Jesus is humble, but he's not mild or retiring, is he? Jesus has been sent by God as the king, and so he conducts himself like the king. He confronts the enemies of God's people. He confronts the lazy and the apathetic of God's people. He opens hearts and exposes motivations. And he reaches out in passion to those who are broken and damaged on the outside. This week is a week of immense conflict. It's not a calm week. It's not a week of balm and gentleness. The king is here. In fact, When you get to the crucifixion of Jesus, we are reminded that he's not killed for being boring or beige, is he? He's killed for being explosive and disruptive because he's perfect and faithful and obedient and truthful. We're in the last of three parables that Jesus tells on this second day. And each of these parables confirms how disruptive and faithful Jesus is. Each of the three parables have been told to the religious leaders of the day and each have progressed. Each of the parables would have been plain to the original hearers. Each of them is spoken clearly to those religious leaders of God's mob. We meet them in chapter 21, verse 23. Each of the parables confronts those leaders with their apathy with their abuse of God's kindness, with what they've done with the king who's wandered into their presence. Each of the parables reveals the identity and authority of Jesus, the identity as king and the authority to judge and confront and to heal and to bind up. Each of the parables makes clear that Jesus is from the Lord and this is wonderful in our eyes. And each of the parables confronts readers ever since with what they've done with Jesus. With what they've done with Jesus. This final parable, chapter 22, 1 to 14, is a little sharper for people like us. It's got a very clear structure. If you've got your Bibles there, verses 1 to 7, Jesus deals with his original audience, the religious leaders who are still listening to him. But then against the backdrop, of what he says to them from verses 8 and following, he then seems to be speaking to his followers now. Those outsiders that have been brought in, the disciples and the crowd that have come with him from Galilee. He confronts the old insiders and then he invites the new insiders to come more inside, if you can, to the kingdom of God. Look there at verse 1. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent out his slaves to some of those invited to the banquet, but they didn't want to come. Again, he sent out other slaves and said, tell those who are invited, look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered. Everything's ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went away. One to his own farm, another to his business. And the other seized his slaves, treated them outrageously and killed them. The king was enraged. So he sent out his troops, destroyed those murderers and burned down their city. Point two on the outline. Now, this parable follows immediately from the two before. Chapter 21, verse 23 tells us the audience, the chief priests, the elders of the people. That's the them. This parable, like the two that have come before, is about the kingdom of heaven. Such a kingdom is like a massive banquet. Jesus knows his audience. He knows we like food, doesn't he? And so he uses terms that appeal to us. It's a wedding feast. The king has organised a wedding feast for his boy. And people have been invited. They've already formally RSVP'd and accepted the invitation. And when the moment has arrived and the banquet is established and all the meat and the on, all, the, all the food is set up, the king sends out the slaves to bring the invited guests in. Look there in verse 3. Come, come. But they didn't want to come. 
Again, he sends out slaves to bring the invited guests in and it reiterates how extravagant and how good and how lavish this banquet is. There is a necessity to come, uh, to actually come and sit down, not just to formally accept it, but to come and sit at the banquet. What do they do, verse 5? They paid no attention and went away. For some, there's a distraction. One writer says... Legitimate occupations become sinister when they become preoccupations. Business, the farm, the harvest. Well, I can't go to the banquet. That's much more important. For others, there's actually an active rejection. The messengers are treated outrageously and some are even killed. Can you imagine that? Killing those who have invited you to come to a banquet that is given for you in grace and kindness. The king's outraged. He's been persistent and generous. Three invitations, sent messengers, lavished food and got preparations organised. Everything is set up. He has been abundant in his goodness and mercy and it's been rejected. It's been treated lightly, wantonly, willfully. A wedding banquet for the son of the king? I've got some farm business. A wedding banquet for the son of the king? End of financial year time. Wedding banquet for the son of the king? Go away, you ratbag. Don't invite me. And so what does the king do? Did you notice what he does there in verse 7? The king was enraged. So he sent out his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned down their city. It'll actually happen in about 40 years to Jerusalem. In AD 70, the city will be burned down. It will happen. The king is enraged. I don't think those original listeners could have avoided what Jesus was saying, could they? Remember those religious leaders? The message is clear, the king is God, the son is Jesus, the original invitees are those standing right in front of Jesus, listening to him, challenging him, and Jesus judges them for their persistent and willful hypocrisy. They've formally accepted the invitation and the privilege, but they don't want to act on it. They don't want to come and sit down at the feast, they don't want to be changed by the invitation, it doesn't... It doesn't affect their lives. They are preoccupied with other things. And so the king judges them. Can you see what Jesus is saying there? Well, the king's generosity is then described again in verse 8. I'm at point 3 on the outline. Then he told his slaves, the banquet's ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go to where the roads Exit the city. Invite everyone you find to the banquet. So the slaves went out on the roads and gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. The wedding banquet was filled with guests. Again, the king sends out his slaves. This is the fourth time. Again, he states judgment on the original invitees. Uh, Those who were invited were not worthy. And again, he extends an invitation. All of those who inhabit the byroads and the crossroads and the highways are to be invited in. The city has been raised and all are now invited to the banquet of the sun. All people, regardless of their dress and their moral history. Do you notice there both the evil and the good are invited? Everyone's invited, regardless of skin colour, education, welfare, family tree. Invite everyone you find to the banquet. And the slaves do what they're commanded. Uh, What happens to the banquet hall? It's chockers. It is filled to the brim. There's movement in this parable, isn't there? There's a movement in this parable that's absent from the first two. The original invitees treated the mercy of the king with hypocrisy. Formal head nod, but no change, and they were judged. The king then extends his invitation to everyone, regardless of their attributes, their track record or history, and the banquet is filled. How generous is the king? Exceedingly generous. Kind, extensive in his mercy 
He, he just extends his grace, his unmerited generosity to, to anyone who happens to be walking on the road. Just come in. Right, the king then goes to view the feast, the kingdom of heaven. Look there in verse 11. But when the king came in to view the guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed for a wedding. So he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him up hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Point four on the outline. Uh, the invitation is extended to anyone and everyone. But when you get an invite like that, it, it changes you, doesn't it? It affects you. Uh, I mean, just think about what happens when you get a wedding invite. Automatically, you go to your diary and you blot out that day, don't you? You RSVP, and then you make sure that you're dressed appropriately. That's what we do. That's how we respond. An invitation to the feast of the king's son means that the invitee will be dressed accordingly. The standard of dress, listen carefully, the standard of dress is not the foundation for the invite. But the invitation changes the way you're dressed. The standard of dress is not the foundation for the invitation, but the invitation changes the way an invitee is dressed. And there's a man at the feast who was, well, do you notice how Jesus describes him in verse 11? He was not dressed for a wedding. The king goes and confronts him. Do you notice how gentle the king is? Friend. Friend. How did you get in here if you're not dressed appropriately? The man's got nothing to say because he knows he's in the wrong and he's thrown out, condemned to the same fate as the original invitees. Jesus sums it all up in verse 14, for many are invited but few are chosen. The king is generous with his invitation, generous to a fold, isn't he? Abundantly kind, abundantly extravagant, abundantly gracious. But there is an appropriate response to the invitation, isn't there? A response that doesn't just formally say, yep, I'm coming, but then prepares appropriately for the banquet. And these words of Jesus in verses 8 to 14 are against the backdrop of verses 1 to 7. So Jesus is now clearly talking to those who have been brought with him to Jerusalem, the 12 and the crowd. Put simply, Jesus is now warning the new insiders about becoming like the old insiders. Remember those old insiders? Yeah, yeah, no, we'll come. But when the time came, they didn't respond appropriately, did they? They weren't dressed. And Jesus is saying, don't be like them. It's a warning to his disciples and the crowd that have become attached to him. Don't just accept the invitation. Be transformed by the invitation. Dress appropriately. So what are we going to do with a parable like this? I'm at the last point on the outline. Well, we've already touched on the various meanings of the parts of the parable. Well, the banquet, that's a picture of the kingdom of heaven. The king is God, the son is Jesus. The original invitees are the nation of Israel represented by their leadership group and everyone are the disciples in the crowd with Jesus. The parable teaches us about the nature of the king, about the nature of the king, about God and his son Jesus. They are magnificently abundantly, persistently, constantly, transparently, good, kind, generous and gracious. They've created a feast at significant cost to themselves. It is extravagantly grand and fundamentally good. They invite and invite and invite and invite. They invite anyone, good or evil. They invite everyone. Jesus wants us and his original listeners to know how wonderfully good this thing is from God. How magnificent it is. So please marvel at that. Marvel at how good and kind and generous God is. The parable teaches us about the authority of the king. God and his son Jesus 
have all authority over the kingdom of God. And when they exercise that authority, they conduct themselves with goodness and justice. They've prepared the kingdom at cost to themselves. They've established the kingdom at cost to themselves. They have the authority to invite whomever they desire into the kingdom. And we're told who that is, everyone, good or evil. They've got the authority to refuse entry to anyone they desire. Please notice the authority of God and his son Jesus. Such authority is exercised against the backdrop with the same intensity of the goodness and grace we've just seen. Uh, The parable teaches us about the nature of the invitation the king extends. The invitation of this king to this banquet is established where? It's established in his own nature, isn't it? He wants to throw a banquet for his son. There's no prerequisite for this invitation being offered except the generosity of the king. In fact, because it is established in his nature, in his kindness, in his generosity, in his grace, there's no requirement for you to meet a certain standard to be invited. Good and evil are invited. That's grace, isn't it? Kind, unmerited, generous grace. Please understand the grace of this invitation and its extent. Please understand that this same gracious invitation is available to everyone in this room, everyone in this town, no matter their address or their history. The parable teaches us that the invitation changes the invitee. At this point, I want us to understand that this parable is a parable about repentance, about being changed by the invitation and receiving it appropriately from God. The acceptance of the invitation to the banquet is a public and observable thing. It's something displayed not just in proclamation but also in practice. You don't just send back a letter that says, I accept. You then turn up appropriately, dressed for this banquet, showing that you have received the king's kindness and the only reason you are there is because you depend upon him. In fact, that helps us understand a little bit about the appropriate dress, doesn't it? The foundation for this dress the undergoing, in fact, all of the dress appropriate for the feast is about being dependent on the king. He's the one who's extended the invite. He's the one who's established the invite. He's the one who's provided the banquet. You depend upon the king and his son, Jesus, to even be there. So there's your dress. Dependence on the one who has invited you. That's what repentance is turning from independence of God to dependence upon Jesus. And it means that you are changed. It means that you are now someone who acknowledges that Jesus is the king of the banquet. He has rightful authority because he invited you and he's dressed you appropriately for the feast. He's the boss. And to be dressed appropriately is to be changed by him. This invitation comes to everyone regardless of their state, but it leaves no recipient unchanged. It's to be changed by the invitation to the banquet. That's why that reading from Matthew chapter 7 was so important. Just saying, Lord, Lord, is not to be dressed appropriately. It's to say, Lord, Lord, and then to live, Lord, Lord. To be dependent on Jesus, to do the will of my Father in heaven, as Matthew 7, 21 said. Please hear this grave and serious exhortation. This serious exhortation to accept the invitation, it's available to be to anyone, and then to be changed by it. There will be no one at the banquet who should not be there. And that no one who should be at the banquet will miss out. 
That's a grave and serious warning. It's a grave warning to many in our world today who think that they can walk through life going, Lord, Lord, and then stay their own boss. It's a grave warning to anyone who says that what they say and their family tree and whether they've done certain religious acts, whether they're enough. They don't warrant a seat at the banquet. We just heard that from Matthew chapter 7. Here is a grave and serious warning to many in our town, perhaps even some in this gathering today, that if we accept the invitation to the banquet, We are completely transformed by it. We don't come to the banquet just by living and dying. We come to the banquet by being dependent on the one who invited us. And so it's a reassuring joy to those who throw themselves wholeheartedly on Jesus. You won't miss out. The seat's already prepared. Your name tag's there. The meal is served. You will not miss out on the banquet because you are completely dependent on the one who set the table. Let me pray. Father, thanks for Jesus. Thanks for being able to walk with him in this last week of his life. Thanks for this wonderful parable that shows how generous you are, how kind and gracious, how warm and persistent, how broad in your invitation. But, Father, help us not to miss your exhortation here to be changed by the invitation to accept it and then throw ourselves in dependence on Jesus. Father, please convict us. Please change us. Please prepare us daily for that feast. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? Wani. I'm just curious about if I had got into the banquet um, and you were saying that it was like a kingdom of heaven, mm. does that mean that the people will actually see the kingdom of heaven and then be together? It's a good question, and I think there are, um, don't laugh, Dan, I think there are three things we need to consider here. I think the first one is, I think the first one is, you can't push every part of the parable, okay? And so parables um, need to be understood in their context. So I think what, what's saying here, Jesus is using a part of a banquet to say that there will be no one in the kingdom of heaven who shouldn't be there. And there will be no one in the kingdom of heaven uh, who thinks they should be there by other means. Okay, so I think that's the first thing. So don't push the parable too. Is heaven just one big long wedding feast? No, it's much more than that. Okay, so just be careful about how we push things. I think the second thing is uh, everyone will see the kingdom of heaven. When it comes, everyone. Uh, John chapter 5 tells us that on that day, everyone will be raised with physical bodies and we'll all see what's happening and then uh, we'll all appear before the judgment seat of God, 2 Corinthians 5.10, and we'll be judged. So that's the third part. Even hell is under the kingdom of heaven, okay, Uh, because the kingdom of heaven is where the rule of God is and God still rules hell. God hasn't just carved off an area and says, all right, the devil, go and have time there on your own, uh, and I'll just ignore. No, even hell is under the kingdom of heaven. And so even those who've been condemned to that will have seen how good that is, but they won't get it. And that's why I think the first part of the parable is so important. The, The leaders in front of him are standing in a temple in a land that God has kept them in for how many generations despite their stubbornness? And yet the king comes and what do they do? Well, they kill him in three days' time, five days' time. Yeah. Does that answer your question a bit? Yeah.